Hello everybody, I'm going to attempt, um, a foolhardy attempt, at what I would call an SEM speed run. A speed run is when you uh, run through something as fast as possible and uh, don't stop along the way. I'm going to try the same thing. I'm not going to explain everything I'm doing, I'm just going to sort of zip through um, a set of analyses. In fact, the set of analyses I'm going to zip through is this entire order of operations on the uh, stat wiki at the, in the general guidelines section. I'm going to assume we have a good model already developed. I'm going to jot down some hypotheses really quick and then do all of this stuff. In fact, I'll just copy and paste this. It's essentially doing the whole SEM series playlist in a single video. I'm guessing it'll take almost two hours and we'll see if it works. Um, let's go. Control C. And if my notes don't make sense or my jabbering doesn't make sense, I apologize. Uh, this is the model I'm going to be testing. It's sort of a s kind of complex but typical SEM model. Um, let me write down here, see. And I'm going to be making tons of mistakes the whole way through, I'm sure. Um, so just bear with me. I'm not too worried about mistakes. Here we go. Develop some hypotheses. Let me just make sure, make that number one here. Okay. So. We want some hypotheses to represent this model. I'm not going to include all hypotheses, just some representative hypotheses. So let's pick a couple direct effects. Let's say that usefulness, um, H1A and H1B, usefulness impacts information acquisition and decision quality. Let's do that right here. Um, H1A, um, usefulness has a positive effect on um, information acquisition. I'm sure I spelled that wrong. Acquisition. And we're going to say the same thing for H1B. Oops, Control Z. And Control V. There we go. H1B, except it's not information acquisition, it's decision quality. There we go. Let's tighten these up a little bit. Um, bother, no spacing. There we go. Let's have some, um, I'll call these direct effects. Direct effects. There we go. And let's do some uh, mediated effects. Mediated effects. And we'll have, let's just do another something like this. Well, let me copy one. Here we go, mediate effects, boom, control V. And let's say that uh, usefulness mediates the relationship between anxiety and decision quality. Here we go. Usefulness mediates the relationship between anxiety and decision quality. Let's do one more like this. This is H2A, I guess. 2A, we'll make a 2B. There we go, 2B. Ooh, no spacing. No spacing. Okay. And this will be usefulness mediates the relationship between um, how about playfulness and decision quality? That way we're just nice and easy here. Playfulness. Now, obviously, we could have done multiple other uh, hypotheses here. Um, I'm just going to do those two mediated hypotheses. I'll do some uh, moderation and some multigroup as well. And all of this assumes we're controlling for age and frequency. So um, let's do another couple here. Let me highlight that. And then just copy that, control C, control V, and we'll call this moderated, moderated effects, and we'll call this H3A, and we'll say that um, experience, let's say, strengthens the relationship between anxiety, actually it would dampen the relationship between anxiety and playfulness and we'll just make it quick. All right, 
uh, experience dampens the negative relationship between anxiety and decision quality. What did I say? Experience dampens the negative relationship between anxiety and decision quality. Nice. And let's do one more like this. And there we go. Call this H3B. I'll we'll say experience. Um, spelled that wrong. Experience um, strengthens uh, the positive relationship between playfulness and information acquisition. That might actually make sense. Yeah. Um, let's see, experience strengthens the positive relationship between playfulness and information acquisition. There we go. Um, let's do some multi-group. Multi-group. And call this 4A and 4B. The multi-group we have right now is gender. So that'll be fun to theorize about. Let's say that um, gender moderates, uh, well, let's say the relationship between playfulness and usefulness is different for males and for females. Let's say that the playfulness usefulness is, I don't know, um, stronger for females. Um, so the relationship, the relationship between playfulness and usefulness is stronger for females than for males. Actually, we could just say stronger for females, and then it's implied it's uh, you know versus males, obviously. Control C, Control V. And let's do one more here, B. And let's say the relationship between um, anxiety and usefulness uh, is stronger for, see the relationship between anxiety, anxiety and usefulness is stronger for females? Uh, sure. And I'm gonna call this the negative relationship, negative relationship. And this has got to be the positive relationship. There we go. That way we have declared a direction. Um, and then that's it. So we have a set of eight hypotheses here covering everything from direct effects, mediated, moderated, multigroup. Uh, I think we're good in that regard. We're not going to do moderated mod moderation, even though we could. We could do like a multigroup of the interaction. Or I could do an, a mediation of the interaction, which would be crazy. Let's not do that. Here we go. So we have done number one. Number two, case screening. Obviously, in this step, step though, um, in the hypothesis step, you would include some support, something like uh, logic goes here, right? Um, and control C, and here, and here. You get the idea. Okay. So include your logic. Case screening, missing data in rows. Let's go grab our data. Here it is. Uh, I'm just going to use the boot camp data here. And I'm only going to use, uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of anything I don't need. Also, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to save this so I don't lose it by accident. Let's just save it. Uh, for now, I'm going to be a bad boy and save it to the desktop. Such a bad idea. Save. There we go. Okay. SPSS. I'm going to get rid of all the variables I don't need. I don't need adoption. Delete. I don't need atypical use. Delete. Comp use. Do I have a comp latent? I don't. So I'm going to use comp use here. Um, design expectations fit. Efficacy. Don't need those. Ease of use. Don't need that. Enjoyment. Nope. Multi purposing. Playful. I do need. Now you may say, why are you deleting them? Why not just put them at the bottom of the. Um, the sheet, and you know that's probably a better idea, but I'm not doing that, so blah. Um, social desirability, I'm actually going to keep social desirability. Um, at least the first five items, I actually don't need these next 
five, so I'm going to delete those. System satisfaction, oh, control Z, ah, I got rid of uh, one of the information acquisition by accident. Oh, clear, there we go, clear. And decision quality, we're keeping. Unfaithfulness, we're deleting. Usefulness, we're keeping. Why, why is it doing that? Uh, clear, no, oh, get rid of all these, please. Clear, there we go. Um, comp score, don't need that. Doing that. Uh, age, let's see what we were controlling for here. We're controlling for age and frequency. We also need to keep experience, which is hiding. There we go, experience and gender. So, age, don't need education. Delete that one. Uh, we need gender, experience, frequency. Don't need child order or any of these guys here. Clear. All right, so now we're just left with what we need. I'm going to file save as, so I don't break things. Let's see, save as. And I'll just save it here. You can't see it right now, but that's OK. Um, SEM speed run, speed run trimmed. OK. All right, I've saved it. Just trust me. Here we go. The first thing we were supposed to do here after developing hypotheses for which we provided logic, hopefully, is look for missing data in rows. So let's go look for some missing data. Data view. And one thing we can do is just go to Analyze, Descriptives. Actually, hmm. Well, what we could do, easier way to do this, would be just to <laughs> Control A, Control C, and it thinks about it for a bit. Go open up Excel. And I know there are ways to do this in SPSS, but I'm doing a speed run, so I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. Um, let me just shrink this to the right size so you can see it in here. There we go. OK, paste this in here. And what I want to do is find out how many are missing. One way to do that is just right here in the top at the end, say, equals count blanks of this entire range, assuming I'm interested in that entire range. Let's pretend I am, because um, we already cleaned out the data set of all variables we weren't interested in. Then I just copy that down and look for big, big numbers. I don't know that there are going to be any big numbers. Let's keep scrolling. One missing, one missing. Oh, we have a couple down here, 36 missing. I'm just going to delete those actually in SPSS. It would be easier to do it that way. Or I could, yeah, let me just do it here, in SPSS. Um, so just at the very bottom here, looks like we had two, yeah, these two right here that are missing almost entirely. So I'm going to take these two, right click, and clear. Boom, we're down to 379. We should probably report that, that we dropped two because they were missing so many values. Um, now let's write that in, I guess. Um, Missing data in rows, something like, oh, whoops, ah. We uh, removed two uh, rows in our data set due to um, missing data over 20%. Missing over 20% of the data, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> that's totally justifiable. If they didn't answer your survey, you can't use their responses. Um, we also need to look at uh, unengaged responses. So that's a little trickier. If I go back to Excel, and let me just make this match my SPSS by deleting these two. Um, let me go back up. OK. One way to find, um, let me delete that. One way to find unengaged responses is just to eyeball it, which is really difficult, right? Um, it, it's actually pretty tricky. So one thing I like to do, this is not a published threshold or anything, is I look, like to look at the standard deviation um, to see if there is a standard deviation. And actually, it's probably not going to be of that whole area. It's just going to be of those latent item, uh, the items from a latent construct. Let me resize this so it doesn't include age and stuff like that. There we go. So just that group. All right, and so the, th the idea is if somebody put three for everything or five for everything, then you'd have zero standard deviation. Again, this is not a, a threshold that is published. It's just a good way to find potential 
unengaged responses by looking at low standard deviations. Um, so we're still looking, still looking. I actually don't see anything too low here. Um, one thing we could do is conditional formatting, highlight cell rules uh, less than, <coughs> let's say, <coughs> excuse me, less than 0 0.05, uh, 0 0.5. Mm, let's try that. Okay. And if I look, ah, now I can see there are a few that are violating this. So this one has a 4, 5. We can go look at it. Look, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. It's, it's this right here, this one. Um, lots of threes, threes, more, th well, there's a lot of threes. The question is, are they even useful if they put three for everything? Um, they put a four here and a two there, but that's it. And I would say they are not useful. I would, re I would keep that flagged and I would probably delete them. Um, in fact, more than useful, they're, they're harmful. We'll look at this one here. Looks like they put all fours. So we look at this four, yep, fours. Oh, but then you got some threes and some more threes and more threes actually. So is this person useful? Mm, maybe if they're not even like extreme. So if they were like ones and fives, maybe we'd have some use for them. But they're right in the middle too. So again, probably not that useful. Um, scrolling down. Here's another one. Let's see. Three, 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 lots of threes, a four, a four, a two, two. Eh, hard to say this one's not engaged. Uh, so it, it's a case by case basis. Even though this person's less than 0.5, which is the threshold I'm saying, um, it looks like they might have been engaged. Um, whereas everyone else, except this last one, whoa, zero. That means they put three for everything. I'm actually just going to delete that row right now. So I'll go back to SPSS and delete this row because they have zero variance clear. And let's go back to those other two as well. Um, so it wasn't that one, it wasn't that one, it was these two up here. Okay, this guy. That's uh, row 122. If I go over here to number 122, 122, then this is the person who had all threes all the way across, except a couple fours. So um, I'm going to delete that one. It is important you do these from bottom to top, because now number 123 is 122 because I deleted 122 but the ones above it haven't changed so this guy up here number um, is it 70 yep number 70 hasn't changed so let's go up to 70 I'm gonna delete number 70 as well just double check that this is oh, 232 33 well you know what this might be harder and then a bunch of threes well I think that's gonna be hard to just fight I'm gonna leave that one in so we remove two so what should we do we should go back to our little thing here and say um, we removed two cases uh, due to um, uh, being not engaged. What does this mean? Uh, they answered uh, somewhat agree to everything, every uh, Likert scale item. There we go, something like that. Okay, looking at outliers on continuous variables. Do we have any continuous variables? Let's go to the variable view. Anxiety, no, comp, no, 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 no. These are continuous, except we have age and I think experience. Let me go double check that. And fr frequency is not. Frequency is ordinal here. You can see frequency is on a one to eight scale. Um, experience and age, I think, are actual numbers, like years. Yes, they are. So let's go look at those. Let's go do descriptives. Um, here we go. Statistics, outliers. There they are. Um, continue and plots. I would like a, uh, you know, we might as well do a histogram over here. I just see the normality of these. Here, continue. And let me throw in those two variables, age and experience over here and give me both hit OK here we go um, in terms of uh, outliers let's go find extreme values here we go um, on age we have a 35 year old 
and a 34-year-old. The question is, are those erroneous? Mm, probably not. Um, the lowest, we have a 9-year-old. I believe that is erroneous since we're uh, surveying college students. So I should go take a look at that one. Um, and in experience, we have 15 years of Excel experience. That's a lot. Um, and zero for the other side, which is fine. We go look at the normality, pretty normal in age, and somewhat normal on experience. Not too bad. Let's go look over here. Oops. Um, if we just go like this, uh, experience, right click, sort ascending. Let's try descending. Descending. We have 15 years of experience with Excel. And the question is, is that rational? Someone who is 21 years old has 15 experience with Excel. Uh, mm, could be. It's possible. It's improbable, but it, it's possible. They've been using Excel since they were six. Could be. Uh, and same with the rest of these. So it's hard to exclude an experience outlier. Let's look at age. We found we had a nine-year-old. Definitely not correct. Um, should I impute this with the mean or median or just guess the value? I would just guess because these are college students. The highest probability is that this is a 19 year old and they just missed the one. So I'm going to put 19. Especially given that they have three years of experience with Excel, I, I doubt they're 29 or 39. Um, most logical value here is 19. All right, so we have that. Anything else weird going on here? Um, nope, I think we're good. So those are outliers. And, um, and so what do we report here? Uh, there was one uh, outlier in terms of age. The respondent reported being nine years old, as these are college students. We uh, replaced the value with 19, assuming typographical error, input error, or something like that. Input error. Cool. Um, all right, that was outliers. Variable screening. Let's look at missing data now. OK. Analyze, descriptives, frequencies, and I want to look at all the variables I'm interested in, which is all of them. Actually, not social desirability. I don't care that much about those. Um, but everything else. So I'll throw everything else in there. Let me get rid of social desirability. Also notice I didn't include ID, because that makes no sense to include ID. Um, statistics, as long as I'm at it, let me throw in the skewness and kurtosis. Continue and OK. And here is this table that shows me missing values. Notice here's the missing row here, and there is nothing missing yet. Let's keep looking, looking, looking. Oh, there are two missing from Playful 4. I should make a note of that. Let's do that. Um, let's go over to our Word document. Um, Playful 4. Actually, let me just start writing it. Um, We observed some missing values in the following variables. Playful 4, 2, missing. Um, and let's keep going. Uh, nothing else missing. Hey, nothing else missing. That's fabulous. Excellent. So just Playful 4. Well, with those missing, um, we could just do this. You know, since Playful 4 is part of Playful Everything Else, let's go look at Playful 4. Um, it, it's a latent reflective construct is what I'm trying to say. Sorry. Uh, and here's Playful 4. We go look at the wording and make sure it's in the same direction. Um, I'm flexible when I interact with Excel. I'm playful when I interact with Excel. I'm inventive. So these are on the same direction. So what I would do is I would impute it based on these guys right around it um, for that same person. So let's go find that person who had it missing and we'll impute it. Okay, let's go look at the data. Oh, it's back here. Data. And we'll go to Playful 4. Here's Playful 4. And let's go find the missing value in here. 
Now the easy way would probably just be to sort ascending, huh? Oh well. <laughs> Where are you? Should still sort ascending. Oh, there it is right here. Oh look, this is easy. Playful one, two, three, five, six, and seven are all twos. So what do you think playful four is? I'm gonna say it's a two. Makes sense. Okay. Um, let's go back to our Word document. We observed some missing values in Playful 4. We observed two. Uh, oh, is it two? Two. So there's one more in there somewhere. We better go find it. Um, doo -doo -doo. Where are you? Here you are. And look at that. Three is all the way through that one. So I'm going to replace that with a three. And why wouldn't I just use like the, the median for the entire column? Um, because this is a much more accurate value um, because it's what they answered already. Let's see, we observed two missing values in Playful 4. Uh, we looked at the surrounding values of the other uh, indicators for that, for the latent factor playfulness. And we use the average, uh, actually the mode, mode um, value for that respondent to impute the missing value for uh, to impute missing values. Good, perfect. That's it. I'm going to save this. All right, skewness and kurtosis. We just looked at this, um, but didn't actually look at it. Here it is, skewness and kurtosis. Um, we are looking for values uh, greater than the absolute value of 1. Now there are other thresholds we can look at, but right now that'll do. So look at the skewness row here and the kurtosis row here. Um, nothing really extreme. You got this one here, 1.094, but if I were to round that, it would actually be 1.0, so I'm not too worried about that. Um, nothing, nothing. Oh, a 2 over here. Hey, we got a few over here. Let's, um, let me stop it right here. Okay, we have a 2 here for information acquisition 1, and a 2.5 again on information acquisition, and a two, oh, almost a 2 here. So there's, there's some trouble in information acquisition, ooh, and in decision quality. So let's report that. Let's go look at the rest if there's anything else. There's a little bit in usefulness. That's it. Okay, so use finish, decision quality, and uh, information acquisition. Notice in all cases, the most extreme value, oh, age also, I'll talk about age in just a sec. Um, the most extreme value so far is 2.2, 2.2, 2.5, 2, uh, 2 not too big. So let's go over here and talk about skewness and kurtosis. Um, for, uh, we, we observed, we observed, it was just kurtosis, right? We had no skewness issues. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, no real skewness. Oh, yeah, there's one on age, but again, I'll talk about that. Um, okay. We observed uh, fairly normal distributions for our um, indicators of latent factors and for all other variables. Example, age, ah, age experience. Um, in terms of skewness, however, we observed uh, mild kurtosis, kurtosis for the indicators of our dependent variables, uh, which would be info qual and uh, decision quality. I'll just abbreviate now, um, and for one of our mediators. Um, usefulness. The these kurtosis values ranged from um, benign to benign, oops, benign to uh, an extreme uh, to 2.5. Was it 2.5 or negative 2.5? It does sort of make a difference. Um, it determines the shape of that kurtosis. Uh, a negative kurtosis would be a flatter, a, high, a positive kurtosis, it's positive, uh, would be more peaked. All right, 2.5. Um, while this does uh, violate strict 
rules of, cur of normality. Normality. It is within uh, <coughs> more relaxed. <laughs> that's probably not the way to, right way to word this. Uh, rules suggested by there are several. Uh, Klein is one of them. And if you want to know what that reference is, we can go back to uh, where are you here. And you can go to the references page right here and search for Klein, Control F, Klein. And it's this one, Principles and Practice. It's 2011. OK. Klein, 2011. Who, ooh, that's not 2011. Who uh, recommends, uh, I think it's like 10, something ridiculous. 10. As the let's use a softer threshold. Um, uh, Sposito is that in here? Sposito. Look at that. Sposito is in there. Uh, Sposito at all 1983. Let's use that. Sposito. Sposito at all uh, 1983. 1983. Who recommend 3.3? Uh, 3 .3, I think it is. Uh, as the upper threshold for normality. So we're good. All right, we are on the EFA. Wow, that was not fast. <laughs> All right, control S. EFA. Over here, let's save this and uh, analyze dimension reduction, factor analysis. Here it is, and um, oh my goodness, am I recording? Recording is recorded. Recording. Oh, good. Huh, I am recording. Good. All right. Um, let's throw all of these in here. All of the latent items that is, except social desirability. I'll take those back out. I re really should stick those at the bottom of my data set. Um, we're not going to throw in age, experience, gender, frequency, because these are not part of latent reflective factors. And again, only latent reflective factors belong in here. Descriptives, I'm going to do the usual stuff, so you don't need to hear about all of that. Oh, whoa. Ah, here it is. Um, I'm going to do maximum likelihood to start. Uh, it is a little stricter, but that is fine. Rotation. I'm going to use Promax to start, um, as it is good. <laughs> I have reasons for this on my other videos and slides and things. Uh, let's sort by size. Let's suppress. Actually, it's not sort by size to start. Let's suppress to 0.3, because I'm expecting 0.5s or higher. And hit OK. KMO is good. Um, communalities, extraction column, everything's above 0.3 for the most part. Yes. So we're good. We extracted six factors. Did we expect six? Let's go back to our model. Here it is. Did we expect six? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, we did. Oh, that's actually very fortuitous. Not for the video, but for uh, me. Um, I skipped that. Look at this reproduced matrix. 4% non redundant residuals. We want 5% or less, so that's good. And let's see if everything panned out the way we wanted. Anxiety, looking pretty good. Lowest loading here is 0.64, and it's all on its own. Um, comp use is looking pretty good. And playfulness is all together. Lowest of 599 is totally fine. Um, information acquisition, those are all pretty low. We might want to think about how to improve that. Uh, decision quality, look, there is a Haywood case here, but it's going to resolve itself, I hope, over time. But notice there are some issues here with decision quality. We have a low 0 0.3, 0 0.4, um, and then usefulness is great. So what are we going to do? The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at information acquisition decision quality in isolation um, in a uh, reliability analysis. So let's go to scale reliability, and let's look just at, um, what was it, uh, decision quality. Here we go, decision quality. Here and statistics. Scale if item deleted. Continue. OK. And it's a great Cronbach's alpha. Wow. Uh, could it get better? And the answer is yes if we got rid of uh, decision quality 13. Um, do we want it to get better? Well, not necessarily, but we're trying to improve the factor. So I'm going to go ahead and drop 13. 
um, and see how that affects things. Let's go ahead and look at another reliability analysis for um, information acquisition. Let's see if there are any insights here. And again, it's, it's fabulous, 0.837. Could we improve it? Yes, if we removed the last one, uh, number five. So let's remove five and 13, and let's make note of that um, in our write-up. So here's the EFA. Where'd it go? Down here. EFA. Um, I'm just going to create some notes here. Uh, removed info acquisition five and decision. I'm going to put commas because we might remove more. Comma decision quality uh, 13. Low loadings and as indicated by uh, reliability analysis. Okay. Let's go back to here and let's try that with those two things removed. Factor analysis, get rid of information acquisition 5 and decision quality 13 and see if that helps anything out. We're going to ignore most of the rest of this. Uh, it was all good before. We're still at six factors. I uh, jumped down here um, and everything, just cursory glance at everything else. Really, we're interested in information acquisition right here, which is looking better, I think and um, decision quality, which is looking possibly worse. Haha, <laughs> interesting. And still have that Haywood case. So here's what we're gonna do. Let's have some fun. And I'm just gonna do a factor analysis with, um, with, get rid of that, with these two. Cause it's gonna be, mm, these three, yeah, just these two. It's gonna be messy is my guess. But I wonder if decision quality is going to break up. It didn't. Interesting. Um, so I go down to the pattern matrix. Stays together. It's a little stronger. Um, let's run it one more time. I'm going to throw in a really strong construct like uh, usefulness. This is a very strong construct. It holds together very nicely. Jumps straight to the pattern matrix. All right. I'm going to go ahead and drop decision quality 11. That loading is just far too low for my liking. Uh, the rest seems all right. So get rid of number 11, decision quality 11. And let's throw everything else back in. Anxiety, compuse, playful, all that stuff. Um, not social desirability, whoops. And we have still removed these three. Let me go report number 11 there. Um, decision quality. BC qual 11 and 13. There we go. Okay, let's run this and hope it's good. Uh, information acquisition looks great. Decision quality looks actually just fine. Just fine. There's that low one there, but it's not too bad. So, what would we do at this point? We'd go do, uh, well, we'd, what I would do is I would uh, right click this, copy and go over to Excel and just at the bottom, well, and just at the top of this, um, paste this in here. And then I'm going to make a row for uh, Cronbox Alpha. Cronbox. Cronbox Alpha. There we go. And I'm going to stick it right here. Uh, so here we go. Usefulness is first. Let's go to a Cronbox Alpha on usefulness. And usefulness, here you are. And OK. And it's 0.942. So I'm put that in here. 0 0.942. And then for the next one, it's anxiety down here. Whoops, Control Z. Uh, anxiety, we kept all those items. Reliability analysis, anxiety. Okay, and it's 0.934, very nice, very nice. 0 0.934, and um, the next one is uh, playfulness. Reliability, playful, where'd you go, where'd you go, where'd you go? Playful right here. I think it's just seven items, yep. And run that, and it's 914, very nice. 0 0.914 and the next one is decision quality and it's just 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12. So don't do it for everything, just do it for the ones that are still there. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 on decision quality. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 
and 12, not 11 or 13. And it's 0.908, very nice, 0 0.908, oops, I08, 908. And then we have CompUse. Only four items there. Good thing they worked. Uh, 819, good. 0 0.819. And the last one is information acquisition. Run that. Um, if I'm going too fast for you, that's fine. Oh, we don't want number five. Uh, just one through four. Uh, you can always pause or slow down. You can actually play vi videos if you're on a browser. Um, you can play them at a slower speed. All right, 0 0.841. 0 0.841. On the alternative, if I'm going too slow for you, you can also speed it up. All right, so now we have our Chromebox Alpha, which demonstrates reliability. We have our uh, EFA, which demonstrates convergent validity, uh, loadings on a single factor, and discriminant validity, uh, no cross loadings. So we're good. We may also want to report our correlation matrix. So let's go grab that. Um, let's just go back to our factor analysis and run it again. And just jump straight down to factor correlation matrix. There it is. Copy this and paste it. What are we looking for here? It's a discriminant validity looking for anything on this uh, in this matrix greater than 0.7 uh, off diagonal. And you can see there is nothing. In fact, the closest thing is a 0.622 between 4 and 6. And 4 and 6 in our case are uh, this one, decision quality and information quality. So they're related. Interesting. OK. That's the EFA. Let's go look at our items here. Do we talk about adequacy? Uh, this would be something like um, the KMO and uh, the communalities. And you could write those out. Um, Convergent validity, I just talked about that. Uh, loading amplitude on pattern matrix. So they were all above point, uh, you know, 0.5, which is fine. Um, Hair at all would justify that with our sample size. Discriminative validity, uh, no major cross loadings and, uh, or correlations. Or, or correlations. And then reliability, uh, we just showed the Cronbox Alpha. And we're looking for anything, everything to be over 0.7, which it was. So we're really good, actually. This is a great EFA. Um, save that. Confirmatory factor analysis. So much to do here. Let's go do it. All right. Um, let's grab our pattern matrix again. <laughs> here it is. Right click, copy. Let's go, uh, let's not save this, we want to save the data set. Make sure the data set is saved. Then we're going to go open Amos and file new. I already have a new one here. Uh, go load the data. Make sure it is, again, the saved data. And, nope, not Linda. Where did I put this stuff? This is in Google Drive. Google Drive. And SCM Bootcamp. And data and speed run. All right, hit OK and plugins. Hopefully you have the pattern matrix builder. If not, go get it. I have a video for that. And let me pull this up here so you can see what's going on. Paste, it. paste that in there and create. Please work. It's thinking about it. Oh, it worked. Phew. All right, if it didn't work, you just have to build yours manually. I have a video for that as well. Um, let's go rename these. That's the first thing you should do here. Um, rename variable to uh, useful. And then this one is anxiety. How do I know? It's because it's attached to those items. Um, OK, we have playful, Pl playful. And we have decision quality, decision qual. And we have comp use. Comp use and we have infoac info acquisition all right that's great uh, let's go ahead and set up some settings do we need to estimate means and intercepts no because we have no missing data at this point output um, do we need the standardized estimates yes yeah, square multiple correlations no not at this point uh, modification indices, I'm going to say yes at this point. We have a lot of data, a lot of variables. I'm not going to set it at 4. I'm going to set it at 40. 
and see what comes out. Uh, hopefully nothing. And anything else we need? N not yet. Do we need a bootstrap yet? No, not yet. All right. Uh, I'm going to save as um, where we were. Bother. Uh, do, do, do up here. Google Drive. SEM Bootcamp. Where'd you go? And Amos. I got all that stuff in there. Uh, let's say. Uh, actually, I'm going to create a new folder in here called Speedrun. Speed run. There we go. And I'm going to call this uh, CFA initial. This is my first CFA. Who knows what it's going to turn out like. We'll run it. Please work. Oh, it ran. Hallelujah. We do the up arrow, hit standardized estimates, and we look at all these values. If you want to zoom in, you just scroll up. Um, but I'm actually going to do it differently. Let's see if this breaks my computer here. Please work. Oh, yeah, baby. All right. So there we are. Um, those look really good. And then they look good there. They look good. I mean, good is, you know, over 0.6 or 0.7. Everything looks pretty good. So that's great. Let me windows out here. All right. Um, so let's see how good. Let's go look at model fit. Here it is. And there are no errors being shown here. We go look at model fit, and we see we have some degrees of freedom. That's good. Uh, our CFI is above 0.9. Ideally, it'd be above 0.95, but I'm not too worried at this point. Um, we look at the RMSEA. It's less than 0.06, which is good. Our high for our RMSEA is below 0.1, which is great. Um, we'd love our p-close to be a little higher, you know, above 0.05 or so. Uh, let's just take a gander at the modification and see if there's anything major going on here. Um, we have two pretty big deals going on, E19 to E20, E3 to E4. Let's go look at these. Um, E19 and E20. That's these two right here, playful 5 and 6. My guess is that these are worded very similarly. Um, if I go look at here, variable view, playful five and six. Here's playful, I am inventive, I am creative. Yep, very similar. Um, do we need them both? I don't think so. Uh, especially since this is a reflective latent factor. They're somewhat redundant intentionally. So let me get rid of the one with the lower loading. Um, which one has the lower loading? Let's find out. Um, playful five is 85, playful six, mm, playful six is 87. So let me get rid of playful five and I'm not going to lose any sleep over that. Playful 5. And what am I going to report? Let's go over here to the wording here. Um, removed uh, the following items due to model fit discrepancies. Discrepancies. Inflating chi-square. Um, and that was uh, playful five, and we'll talk about others in a sec. And then we'll say uh, something like we didn't feel, or we felt justified. Ha. We felt justified in doing this as these factors, now these indicators, items, these items belonged to um, large latent reflective. Latent reflective factors and were thus somewhat redundant. There we go. So we didn't lose any uh, richness in our in our whatever you want to call it um, in our construct. Okay, let's run this again. See if we have our RMC in the right place um, and everything else. Let's go look at the output. Um, the P close, that's what I was talking about. P close. Model fit. Um, it's about the same there. It looks at the RMC. The P close is better. It's 0.05 something at least. I'll go look at modification indices one more time. Uh, E3 and E4. Let's go look at E3 and E4. Whoops, zoom out. It's up here. E3 and E4. Usefulness 3 and 4. Let's go look at the data, at the wording. Usefulness 3 and 4 right here. Using Excel in my work increases my productivity. Using Excel enhances my work effectiveness. 
Uh, I would argue that productivity and work effectiveness are roughly the same thing, although I think I'd prefer to keep effectiveness and drop productivity. Let's go see what the loadings are. The loadings indicate 3 and 4. Let's see. Uh, 4 is a 93. 3 is a 91. So, good. That's what I wanted. I wanted to drop 3 anyway, I think, right? Yeah, the productivity one. So I'm going to drop 3 because, again, it's redundant and it's creating problems uh, with model fit, chi-square inflation. So that was usefulness 4. Let me go write that down. Do, 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 do. Where are you? Uh, usefulness 4. It might just be an and. We might be good at that point. Let's see. Run that. Go check model fit one more time. You may wonder, why am I not just covariating the errors? I could do that too, but like I said, these are reflective latent factors. Um, so those items are largely redundant, especially when you have more than four per factor. Uh, so I would rather delete an item than accidentally create specification errors, uh, which can sometimes mess up uh, the, the calculation of the model. So here we are. Uh, CFI, improving. Nice. Um, if, you, if you care about GFI and all that, that's here. Um, let me go down to be close. Much better. Let's check the RSMR. Uh, if, if, if the SRMR, excuse me, is good, I'm just going to move on. If not, then maybe we'll address a few more modification indices. So plugins, SRMR, let's see, standardized RMR. It's right here. And run. We want something less than, I think, 0 0.08. Uh, we have 0 0.045. We're doing great. Um, so that's this is what I want to get to um, for model fit for now. This is great. So obtain a roughly decent model fit, uh, yeah, we're good. And then validity, let's do that really quick. Um, I have a plug-in, hopefully it works for you. Uh, let's see, master validity, please work, please work. Let's think about it, there we go. And no validity concerns, yeah, that's what I wanna hear. So I'm actually gonna just copy this table right out. These thresholds are from this literature. Um, Let's go over here and throw this in here. Control V. Whoa, that did not paste very well. Can I paste a table? Oh, lame. Who wrote this tool? <laughs> um, I'm going to blame it on my research assistant. Oh, come on. Please work. Control C. Where did he go? Here we go. V. Yeah, it came in. I don't know why it came in the second time. Maybe because I started up higher. Um, okay. And then control. Yeah, just let's make it all fit properly. Uh, no spacing. Is there like a table text? Hmm. Oh, well, no spacing. We could fix it later. We'll fix it later. Um, right now, I'll just shrink it. There we go. Cool. Um, we're looking for values in CR above 0.7, we're good. AVE above 0.5, we're good. We're looking for square root of the AVE on the diagonal to be greater than the correlations here, and we are good in all cases. If we weren't, we'd have to go back and fix it. I think the reason we are good is because we addressed most everything in order of operations, starting with data screening and EFA um, and model fit issues. So we're good. Again, if you weren't good, you'd have to go back and figure out why you weren't good which would be an address addressing low loadings, um, model fit issues, uh, cross loadings in the EFA, things like that. Model fit, which is also indicated, uh, which is also inflated by, uh, by cross loadings. So there would be clues. All right, let's do configurable metric and scalar invariance tests. Let's do it. Configurable, and, and why are we doing this? It's because we have a uh, multi-group later. So let's go over here. Um, we're going to save and then we're going to do group number. We're going to change this to uh, be male, male, and new female, female. There we go. Close. So we now have two groups. Let's give them their data. Um, SEM speedrun. Oh, come on. It's not going to jump straight to it for me. Google Drive and SEM bootcamp and data and speedrun. 
and let's see grouping variable gender okay and grouping variable gender okay and grouping value I believe I had yep 286 males and for females I had only 91 now that might be too small we might have some issues there uh, let's save as file save as and let's call this CFA invariance CFA invariance okay um, there are multiple ways we can do this uh, the first is to um, just leave it like this uh, so configurable invariance is when you just estimate it with two groups and see if they're still good fit let's see if there's a good fit at least I think that's how you do it that's how I remember if I didn't remember where could I figure it out I go to my stat wiki so maybe I'll do that just a sec um, but it looks like we still have decent fit CFI above 0.9 um, P close fabulous RMSA fabulous uh, we can test the RSRMR real quick but first I'm gonna go over to um, my stat wiki and see if I can remember what configurable invariance is it's bad when I don't remember um, CFA and we'll go to invariance configurable okay configurable invariance test whether the factor structure is the same with group when they're tested freely no constraints okay so that's what I just did um, excellent and there's a video for it okay metric invariance is where we uh, constrain paths to be equal excellent and then do a chi-square difference test between the unconstrained and the fully constrained so let's do that so are we good for configurable invariance yes let me write that down um, configurable invariance good as evidenced by uh, good model fit measures when um, estimating two groups freely I dot e dot without constraints cool so that's configurable invariance let's do metric invariance to see if they load roughly the same and then we'll do scalar invariance because because metric invariance all right let's constrain plugins um, pattern do, 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 name parameters and we're going to name the regression weights and hit OK okay and you know what to do this properly we actually ah can I undo that yes I can cool we need to put the variance in the latent factor to do this properly um, so I'm gonna do that I'm gonna go over here to parameters and one 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 and then I'm gonna delete the constraint off of the path here delete why am I doing this because you can't name a constrained path um, a path that's been constrained to a number so I'm gonna get rid of this constraint here and there we go oh, almost ah escape ah, stop no control Z there we go delete all right um, now we're gonna go to plugins uh, name parameters we're going to name the regression weights yep hit OK there we go they are now named across groups you can see male group and female group they are named and they're the named the exact same thing notice they didn't actually change and when they're named the same thing in Amos that tells it to make them equal so now we run it and we get a chi-square degrees of freedom here um, I should have recorded the unconstrained one. Whoops. Oh well. Um, here we go. Model. Uh, notes for the model. Chi square is this number right here. Control C. And if you open up the Excel stats tools, and again, there are multiple ways you can do this. You could actually just do it right in Amos. Um, I like doing it this way because it shows you what you're doing. You have a fully constrained model, which is what we have here with a certain number of degrees of freedom which is 993 993 and then an unconstrained model let me go back to the model and can I undo this I wonder if I can go to like uh, name parameters and then unname them if I uncheck this uncheck yeah, okay 
Oh, okay, darn. <laughs> nope, can't. All right, then I'll just go back to the uh, CFA invariance model. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, darn, I saved it already. <sighs> okay, that's unfortunate. <laughs> uh, darn. All right, I have to go ahead and delete each of these. Um, really quick. Or I could just create the new model. No. I really should have thought that through. Oh, well. Just deleting the names with all groups checked. So, lesson to be learned. Don't constrain first. Uh, get the unconstrained first. <laughs> Eating up that precious time on a speedrun. I would be failing in Mario right now if I were doing a Mario speedrun. There we go. There, it's all set. Ooh. All right. Uh, let me file save this as the unconstrained model just in case. I need to come back to it. Um, CFA invariance unconstrained. Oops, okay. And let's run it. And we get a chi-square and degrees of freedom of right here, this right here, and 960. Here we go. This and 960, 960. And the answer is, are they invariant? Yes, they are invariant. The p-value is not significant, which means uh, there's no significant difference between these groups uh, at the structural, well, at the, at the regressions level, at the loadings level, uh, metric invariance. Now, if they were different, I'd have to go and find out which paths were different. And there are ways to do that. You can, oh, you can, cons you can, when they're all constrained, you can go and unconstrain one path at a time and see what difference that makes. Um, and if it, uh, if it creates a big difference in the chi-square, uh, well, in the degrees of freedom in chi-square, then that is the path that's causing the problem. You could also do a critical ratios quick and dirty check. I have a video for that, um, and it would point to at least it would at least point to the one that was causing the most trouble. So you do it that way. Luckily, we don't have to do that. We're good. So I'm going to go to um, Word here and say metric invariance uh, was good as evidenced by a chi square a non significant non significant non significant chi square difference test um, between the um, unconstrained and fully constrained models uh, where the regression weights the regression weights were constrained all right, scalar invariance, that's where you constrain the intercepts. For scalar invariance, the easiest thing to do is to do a multigroup model. So if we go to analyze and multigroup analysis, and yes, hit the OK, and make sure it is estimating mm, intercepts. I don't know if it is. Let me hit cancel for a sec. To make sure it's going to estimate intercepts, ah, go to the analysis, go to estimate means and intercepts, this means we probably have to uncheck modification indices. And then let's go to analyze multiple group analysis. OK. There we go. Now it's estimating everything. Hit OK. It's going to do a bunch of funky stuff, make it look all messy. What we're going to do, we're actually going to delete a few of these models. We're just going to look at intercepts right now. So um, you can't just right click and delete them. You've got to double click them. And then here's measurement residuals, delete. Structural covariances, delete. Just thinking about it. Come on, delete. Uh, measurement intercepts we want to keep. Measurement weights, um, different ways to do this. I'm going to actually delete this to simplify things just for now. Hit delete and close. All right, so we have the unconstrained and the measurement intercepts um, to test scalar invariance. So let's hit run. And it runs. And go look at the output. Go look at model comparison. And if you look at the p-value here, <clears throat> unfortunately, we are not invariant. Um, 
<clears throat> we do not have structural invariance. That's a bummer. So what does that mean? That means we uh, are going to have trouble making claims on multi-group effects uh, in our causal model later on. Uh, now what can we do about this? Is there a way we can claim something like uh, partial scalar invariance and still make claims? The answer is yes, and the way you do that is you go into, um, let's see, estimates, scalars, intercepts, and let's go to the unconstrained model here. And what we want to do is find the intercept that has the biggest difference um, between male and female. So I'm going to copy this table out and copy. Right now I'm on male, unconstrained, intercepts. Go over to Excel. And let me just create a new Excel file here. Paste this in here. And go back to here. Get the female data. Copy that out. And paste it here. And I'm just going to create a new uh, a new column here. I'm going to call this uh, difference. And it's going to equal the absolute value of the estimate minus the estimate. Um, this is the intercept estimate. Did it click? Yeah. And then close that, enter. And you can see a very small value for that one at least. Let's see if there are any big values. In fact, what we could do, let me zoom out a bit. Zoom out a bit. There we go. Uh, I'm going to highlight this data here. And I'm going to do some conditional formatting. Top. Let's do top 10. See if it lets me edit that. Here we go. Not 10. I'm with the top uh, 3. Okay. And as I scroll through these, I see that the biggest differences are these three right here. All on anxiety. Interesting. So we're, we're probably we probably have scalar invariance everywhere except for on anxiety. Now the rule is, according to uh, Byrne, Barbara Byrne, that um, you have to have at least two intercepts per latent factor that are not um, uh, that when. Uh, th that are constrained to be equal and still achieve a scalar invariance. And then you have what is called partial scalar invariance. So if we were to take care of these three biggest ones, um, we'd still have four left that were constrained. So let's see if we can do that. The way to do that is go back to Amos. Um, wait, these were, let's see, two, four, six. That's easy to remember. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and unconstrain those three. So let's go find anxiety, which is right here. Zoom up into here. And the intercept for two, four, and six. Here's anxiety six, four, and two. Um, ooh, that's hard to see. It's I8, I10, and I12. So we're going to go to the uh, this model, measurement intercepts, 8, 10, and 12. And we're going to say, go down here to the eyes. We're going to take 8, 10, and 12 and unconstrain them. So where are you? I8. Essentially, we're going to delete them. But what I'm going to, hmm, well, yeah, I'm going to delete them. Delete 8, 10, and 12. There we go. What that does, it says you don't have to force these three to be equal. So now, are we uh, scalarly invariant? We'll run this again. Look at the output. Go to the model comparison. And, oh, we're getting close. So close. OK. Um, let's go look at that again. So these are the top three. Were there any others? Let's do, instead of top three, let's do top uh, five. Top bottom rules, top. Um, we do top five. And looks like anxiety three and playful six. So let's go take care of those. Anxiety three and playful six. Now anxiety will still have one, five, and seven. So we're still partially, uh, partially scalarly invariant if we can do it with those. Okay, again, anxiety three and playful six. Anxiety three is I9. Playful six is down here which is I18, I9 and 18. So we're going to go do those ones. I9 is right here, delete, and 18. 
delete close run and pray and hope and here's the output comparison oh we're so stinking close um to 0.05 okay let's try again let's do the top eight let's say conditional formatting top eight and where are they oh oops i did i didn't do it with that, that column my bad let's do the column here now let's do the conditional formatting uh height cell rules um top bottom let's do top eight Ooh, anxiety. Can we do one more on anxiety? One more on playful? Okay. The next biggest on anxiety. We did two, four, and six. And then we did three. The next biggest is five. We'll just do five and then we'll sort of be up the creek on that one. Five and uh, playful seven. Anxiety five, playful seven. Anxiety five is eleven. And playful 7 is 19. 11 and 19. So here's 11. Gonna get rid of that. And 19. And this had better do it because we might be stuck. Run it. And where'd that output go? Here it is. Model comparison. Ooh. <coughs> 0.04. Well, we're close. Uh, not close enough. So what can we do at this point? Well, we can look at other ones on other factors. So anxiety has problems. Um, and playful has problems. Um, does anything else have a problem? There's a 0 0.1. 0 0.19. 0 0.19 is pretty big. Are there any 0.2s up in here? No, so 0.19. Compuse 3. So we're just going to do these one at a time now. Compuse 3 is down here probably. Yep. Compuse 3 is I28. Oops. I28. Delete that one and close and run. There it is. That was the only other one we needed to do. Okay. So, what we can do now is in our paper, where'd it go? What we need to say, let me go back here. Um, what we need to say is for scalar, scalar invariance um, was only partially met due to the need to unconstrain all but two of the items uh, intercepts items plural intercepts for anxiety and uh, two items for playfulness and one item for uh, comp use. So that's what we had to get to. We are partially metric, uh, partially scalarly invariant, which means um, we can still make claims, um, but we need to be careful when uh, looking at claims of multi-group uh, differences when it comes to anxiety in particular. I'm not as concerned about playful and comp use because it was just one or two items on those, but on, on anxiety, uh, there's a serious concern in um, invalid results if we're doing a multi-group comparison uh, in that regard. So there you have scalar invariance. Validity and reliability check. Well, we didn't move or change or edit anything, so our validity and reliability actually stays the same. It's this right here. Um, and we say something like, uh, we observed, observed, uh, convergent and discriminant validity as evidenced by, and then you describe it, uh, convergent, convergent is loadings, well, it's, it's ADE above 0.5, discriminant is square root of ADE greater than correlations, 
spelled correctly. And then, um, yep. Uh, and reliability evidenced by uh, the CR value. That's the composite reliability value. Called construct reliability in some papers. Um, or I think the row value. Is that what it is? I think so. Um, above 0 0.700. Okay. You can write all that up and call that good. And then common method bias. Oof. Hate this thing. Common method bias. Best way to do this is with a marker variable. We have a marker variable. Um, and we need to do it because our dependent variable and our independent variable were captured together in the same instrument. They're both perceptual. Um, and uh, also, there is sort of a more desirable way to answer our dependent variable questions, which are about decision quality and information quality. Of course, we want to say if we got better quality uh, information and made better decisions. So there is a socially desirable way to answer those dependent variable questions. Therefore, we should do a method bias test. Um, so let's do that. This is the unconstrained variance. Uh, it still is. I'm going to save. I'm going to go back to our initial CFA. And I'm going to throw in a, um, a couple things. I'm going to throw in a marker variable. Let me do that first. It's going to be uh, social desirability. Let's go like this. Do, do, do. And uh, one, two, three, four, five. I have five items for that. They are over here. Uh, oops, I can't move. Them. Oh, just a sec. Here they are. Um, social desirability one. Whoops, control Z. Uh, Z, there you go. Social desirability one and two, and I'll fix these in just a sec. Oh, it's, uh, I have to fix them now. Diagram, interface properties, view, interface properties, uh, miscellaneous, display variable labels. Thank you. There we go. Also, I'm going to rotate this. There we go. Um, I'm actually going to stick it that way. And I'll move it with the balloons on. So symmetry is retained. Stick it over here. And if I zoom out, well, it's. It's up here, but it's it's still usable. Okay, social desirability two goes here, and three goes here, and four, and five. Okay, let's name this social desirability. Um, whoops, not variance. Text social desirability, and let's. Plugins name unobserved, all those errors, and let's create a latent, a common latent factor. Oops, common latent factor. And if I, th I think if I highlight it like this, oh, oh come on, there you go. Uh, click, and go to plugins, common latent factor connector. Please work, please work, please work. Oh, it worked. Sweet. Um, that will connect everything to that CLF. We also need to co-vary um, social desirability with everything. Now, theoretically, it shouldn't be uh, related, but but there is uh, a chance that it is related. There we go. That's all connected. Okay, and I'm going to save this as file save as CMB CFA CMB. <coughs> and run it. Proceed. And what we're doing right now is we're uh, estimating a an unconstrained model. Um, oh, it says I have missing data. Yeah, it's because I'm doing social desirability, which has missing data. So I need to uncheck modification indices and go ahead and check estimate means and intercepts. Run that one more time. Proceed. And it ran. Ooh, that's good. It didn't break. Okay, and we we can go and explore it if we want to see if it did break. Um, you can look at these loadings, and if they're not terrible or like flipped sign, then we're probably okay. It looks like we are okay here. Um, what we want to do is we want to get the chi-square and degrees of freedom for this model, this unconstrained model, and then create a zero-constrained model. So. Uh, 
the highest grand degrees of freedom listed right here. It's uh, 1055 and 606. Let's go put that in our little chi square difference test thing. And again, you can do this this way, or you can do it in um, Amos itself, which I'm not going to show you how to do right now. It was 606, 606. But I do have a video for it. Um, let's fully constrain it. Oh, well, we're not. We're going to. We're going to zero constrain it. Is what we're going to do. Um, so, oh no, I think it goes like this. I can't even remember how to use my own tool. How sad is that? I think I go like this. I think I go like this, and then I make sure it's selected. And oh, I gotta name it uh, CLF. Really stupid instructions for this. Now let's see if it works. Please work. Nothing's happening. No, oh, it worked. Hey, and there are zeros there. Okay, so you just have to delete it and rename it. Well, that was not intuitive. I should put instructions on that. All right, and now we run this and proceed. Get the degrees of freedom and chi-square. Where to go? Right here. Here we go. All right, chi-square is 12, 2, 7, and 6, 45. And 645, 645, and the answer is no. These are not invariant. Um, the 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 answer is um, that they're hmm. so invariance means they're the same. Are these the same? No. Which means is zero uh, common method bias plausible? And the answer is no. Uh, there is method bias going on. So that's CMB. Let's uh, report on it. Um, we uh, identified significant method bias in our model as indicated by a significant chi-square difference test in the, um, uh, between, between a zero constrained and unconstrained model. Okay. So that's unfortunate. So we will control for the social desirability factor in our in our structural uh, analyses. Okay. I'll show you what that means in a moment. All right, final measurement model fit. We can take a look at that. Um, here we go. We did we already run this? Yes, we already ran it. So we're going to look at the model fit as reported here. Um, and model fit CFI 0.93, um, CMIN and DF are chi square degrees of freedom. We report those. Um, our RMSEA is fabulous, our P-close is fabulous. We report all those, we report the SRMR, um, and we do it in a nice little table uh, that looks something like uh, this. It's the insert table, um, measure, uh, observed, desired, or threshold, something like that, threshold. And uh, so it'd be like uh, RMS, no, no. Um, Chi square DF CMIN uh, CFI excuse me CFI um, RMSEA P close SRMR something like that and you go get the thresholds for these which are on the stat wiki and except chi square degrees freedom there are no thresholds for those that are just what they are and then you put your actual values here what do we have a 0.931 or something like that here, and an RMC of 0 0.045 or whatever it was, P close of uh, point, it was something high, 1.9, and our SRMR of something like 0 0.0, uh, 0.04. And you do three uh, significant digits here. Anyway, and then you say, yeah, we have good model fit. Um, yay. Okay. 
impute factor scores. Again, I say optionally here. It's actually better not to. Um, the only reason you would, well, there are two reasons you would. Um, the first reason is if you had a low sample size and you needed to uh, reduce complexity in your model. Um, we don't have a low sample size, so we can't use that excuse. The other excuse would be to um, do interactions. We will do interactions, but I think I will do that last and then only then um, impute, well, only then use the imputed composites. Or for now, let's go ahead and impute them and just use them later. So data imputation, um, proceed. And let's do regression and a recall trimmed underscore C in the same folder, impute. Oh, you didn't see that, sorry. Yeah, hit OK. Just hit the impute button. It was over here. So I, I hit I hit the impute button on regression. OK. Um, so that data set now exists. We can use that later. But for now, I'm going to move on to the next steps. OK. I'm actually running out of time here. Structural models. Uh, multivariate assumptions. Oof. Outliers and influentials. OK. Uh, outliers and influentials. We want to do go to. Actually, we'll need the we we'll need the imputed ones for this. So let's go find that imputed data. Um, data. Here it is. I'm going to close this one. Close this one. Don't save that one. And let's open this one. Trimmed underscore C. Here we go. Here it is. Trimmed underscore C. And we need to do, what well, you'll notice at the bottom we have our um, all of our composites, including the CLF and social desirability. Um, I'm not super interested in social desirability right now. I'll stick it down here. Um, and then I'll stick all of these up at the top. Well, I'll stick all of these at the top. OK. And. Here we go. We want to look at the Cook's distance analyze uh, regression linear. And we want to do it with our dependent variables, which are decision quality and information acquisition. Here's decision quality. We can look at um, each variable independently, one at a time, or we can do them together. Uh, let's start with the mediators. Let's start with. Um, usefulness and the other mediator <laughs> which was my brain's failing me here comp use there we go comp use and I want to save a cook's distance here's the cook's distance right here and hit continue and OK and whatever comes out is fine because I'm not actually going to read what came out. I'm going to um, run a chart builder on this real quick. Graphs, chart builder. Here we go. Bring this up. And I would like a scatter dot. Pull this up. Okay. Kirk's distance is on the y axis. And. Um, ID, where are you? ID is on the x axis. And let's see what this looks like. I don't think I did that right. It's processing. Hmm, that worked. Really, we just want to see the Cook's distance. Uh, see if there are any big ones or any outliers on this. Uh, maybe this guy up here is an outlier, um, but not really. Anything where the Cook's distance is above 1. Not point 0.1, but 1. Uh, that's a, an extreme multivariate influential, uh, pot potential influential. Um, let's do one more, just so you can see what's going on here. Um, also, model it differently. Let's do it on information acquisition. Where'd you go? Information acquisition. I'll use these two mediators again. Um, hit OK. It's saving that Cook's distance. We'll do a chart builder. Same chart, but instead of Cook's 1, I'll use Cook's 2. There we go. And instead of ID, I'm going to throw in information acquisition. See if that does anything for us. And hit OK. And here we go. You can see how they're clustered. 
Again, the Cook's distance, nothing's over a 1, and nothing's even over a 0 0.1. So there, I can't really argue that there's going to be an influential. There might be outliers here, but they're not influential is my guess. Um, so we're good. What would I report there? Um, let's go down here. Uh, Multivariate here. Um, we ran uh, Cook's distance analysis to determine if any influential outliers existed. Existed. And this would be multivariate. Um, any multivariate influential outliers existed. Um, in no case did we observe a Cook's distance greater than one. Most cases were far less than 0 0.100, something like that. So we had no cause to remove anything due to being an influential outlier. Uh, Multicollinearity, let me go look at that real quick. That would be, again, regression. If you go do linear regression, let's use information acquisition, and let's use just all of the predicting variables right now. Um, let me get all of them in here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. And is that it, actually? Yep, those. All four of those. And um, we want to stop saving the Cook's distance and continue. And we want to do statistics and look at the collinearity diagnostics and hit OK. And go look at the coefficients here. Look at the VIF. In this case, the VIF is very low. Uh, we want something less than 10. These are less than 3, which means there's no problem. Let's go run them one more time using decision quality as that dependent variable. And the VIFs are, again, very low, not a problem whatsoever. So um, we'd say that. Uh, we um, examined variable inflation factors for all predictors um, on our dependent variables and uh, observed no VIFs greater than 2, which is far less than the threshold of 10. Okay. Include control variables in all the following analyses. Uh, mediation. Oh, time to actually do a test. Mediation, here we go. We're going to test our hypotheses. Um, I'm actually going to test them in order, not, not in the order that was listed there, but the order that's listed in my paper. So we had direct effects first. So let's go test our hypotheses. I'm actually going to copy and paste these down. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? These guys. I'm going to just copy and paste all of this. Copy, paste it down here um, instead of all this stuff. Uh, da, 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 da. Yep. Okay. Well, that numbered everything. Whoops. Uh, there we go. Okay. So, direct effects. Let's see if there's support for these. Um, usefulness has a positive effect on all information acquisition. Does it? Let's find out. We need to turn this into a causal model. So in order to do that, we need to uncovary a bunch of stuff. Um, social desirability is going to stay as a uh, predictor. We're controlling, essentially, for its effect. Uh, so it'll stay covaried to all these others, uh, well, to the predictors. We're going to um, remove all correlations with our dependent variables, which in our case is information acquisition and keep going, keep going, decision quality. Here's decision quality. Better save this as a causal model too, uh, before I forget. Let's let's save this real quick. File save as uh, causal latent. Yep, that work. Um, and then usefulness was a mediator, so we're gonna uncover things with usefulness. And playful no compuse was another uh, mediator, so we'll unco. Oop, ah, control Z. There we go. Um, mm, what we could do for now, actually, let me delete the CLF. Here's uh, usefulness. Let's move this over here. And 
CompUse over here, and Decision Quality over here, and Information Acquisition over here. Okay, and oh, I wish we could reach it. There we go. This way over here. What a nice mess we have here. That's all right. We'll create our own like models uh, in PowerPoint or something, or Lucid Chart, uh, rather than reporting our Amos model. Okay, so we need control for the effects of social desirability on everything, pretty much, which is going to make this nice and messy. We want to predict everything also with anxiety and with playfulness and usefulness predicts that and that are two dependent variables and compuse predicts our two dependent variables there we go and then since we're predicting things we need to add error terms let's move this to where we can see it we need to name those plugins name unobserved and we need to co-vary these two dependent error terms um, because these are related dependent variables. I would argue that our independent or our mediators are also related, usefulness and comprehensive use. Um, so I'm going to co-vary their errors. Everything else I'm going to leave for now. Um, I'm going to save this as causal latent. And let's run it and see what happens, see if it breaks. Hey, it didn't break. That's a miracle. All right, let's just go make sure model fit is tolerable. Well, it should be better than tolerable. Model fit. CFI is still good. Uh, PCLOS is great. RMSA is great. I'm guessing SRMR is great. Um, we need to make sure model fit is good, though, before we start uh, supporting hypotheses. Because if we have bad model fit, that's a global test, um, then our hypotheses are invalid because that's a local test. All right, so let's go look at um, those two things we theorized, uh, those two hypotheses. The first one was usefulness has a positive effect on information acquisition. Does it? it? Usefulness on information acquisition, this one right here. And the answer is 0.34 p-value is less than 0 0.001. Let's go get the standardized effect, um, usefulness. Where'd you go? Information acquisition. Here it is, 0.465. Oh, yeah, positive, 0.465. Um, so this is like evidence goes here. Uh, evidence uh, beta equals 0, 0 0.465, not negative. Ah. Um, and the p-value, it is, uh, I'm going to say star, 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 which is p uh, less than 0 0.001 in this case. Um, probably want to report the confidence intervals there. Uh, do I have that here? I'd have to bootstrap to get those confidence intervals, but I have social desirability bias in there, which has um, missing data, which won't let me bootstrap. That is unfortunate. So for now, I'm not going to include those confidence intervals because um, you need to bootstrap conference intervals. So but the answer is yes, supported. Uh, usefulness has a positive effect on decision quality. Let's see if that's correct, or at least supported. Usefulness on decision quality uh, is 549, which is very strong, most likely. Um, evidence is, let me just copy this. Evidence is beta is 591. Is that what it was? 591, something like that. Um, and 549, excuse me, and the p-value for that decision quality, oops, where are you? Decision quality on, their usefulness on decision quality is, it is a p-value that is significant at 0 0.001, so that is good, this was 49. Okay, so we have evidence. These are supported hypotheses. Let's go to mediation. Um, okay. How are we going to do this? Uh, usefulness mediates anxiety to decision quality. We have multiple mediators, multiple indirect paths, so we have to isolate that effect. One way we can do that is with an estimand. So I have an estimand. You'd click on 
um, you can't see that, can you? Let's go like this for just a sec. If you click on not estimating an estimand, click on the first option, select estimand, and then go get the estimand, which for me, I've stuck it somewhere uh, relevant. Let's see, SEM bootcamp estimands and estimands, and it would be, um, is it ABC? No. Yes? No. My indirect effects, this one. Open. And then you just got to name those paths. So for us, it was anxiety to decision quality through usefulness. So I name, let me double click that path. Oh, come on, let me. There we go. I'm going to name this one parameters, name this capital A, and name this next one to decision quality capital B. And then the S demand, oh, but I can't do it because I have missing data. Uh oh, this is going to be a problem. Um, all right, you got a bootstrap, but we have social desirability here, which has missing data. That's a problem. So for now, oh, this is bad practice. I'm going to delete social desirability um, because it is making it so I can't test my model. Dang. All right. So ideally, you don't have that much missing data in social desirability. Uh, we could have imputed, I suppose. Maybe we should have. So. Let's go to boot uh, here. We're not going to estimate means and intercepts. We're going to go to bootstrap, and we're going to perform a bootstrap. 2,000 is fine. Bias corrected. You can use 95% if you want, or 90. It doesn't matter to me. I'll put 95. Um, and I'll run it. Just going to think about it. It's bootstrapping, so it takes a sec. It actually ran. Hooray. Here we go. And if we go look at estimates, scalars, user defined estimand, here is, well, let me go down here. This is the estimate. If we look at the confidence, we can look at that as well. So it's negative 0.0215. And is the p value significant? No. And here are the confidence intervals for that. Uh, zero definitely exists between these two. Um, and so. This is our evidence. In fact, I'll just copy this whole table, uh, copy and paste it over here. And the answer is no, not supported. Um, not supported. You wouldn't just copy and paste this, but I am for now, for brevity's sake, not supported. And here's the evidence: uh, non-significant p-value for the indirect effect. We we'll do the same for uh, playfulness to decision quality. Let's go look at that. And instead of these two being named A and B, it's going to be uh, this one being named, let's see, playfulness. I'm going to name that one A. The other one's still B. Uh, decision quality to, or usefulness to decision quality is still B. I run this. And it's thinking. It's thinking. Here we go. And look at the output. We go estimates, scalars, user defined, bootstrap confidence. Here it is. And the answer is yes. There is mediation going on. How do I know? Because the p value is significant. And if we look at the confidence intervals on that, let me put this down here. Um, yes. Uh, the confidence intervals, uh, zero does not exist between these. Um, so it is diff definitely different from zero. So good. We have significant indirect effect there. We have a supported mediation. OK, that's mediation. Moderated effects. Experience dampens the negative effect. All right. We're, here we are in interactions. I need to now use a different model. Let me save this as file, save as um, the causal, causal latent. Uh, minus social desirability. And now I'm going to create a new model. Uh, new. Uh, yes, save. Okay. File. Uh, data files. And we're going to bring in that data. Here is speedrun trimmed underscore C. That's the one we want. OK, except actually we need to go edit that one a bit. Here's that data. Um, we want to get 
descriptive statistics descriptives and save standardized values for um, experience and uh, what we're going to be using in its interaction. So that was uh, anxiety and playfulness. Okay, so we'll throw playful and anxiety in here. We're just saving standardized values, that's what we want to do here. And then we're going to multiply those. We're going to go transform compute and we're going to um, say experience times uh, anxiety and we'll go down to the bottom and it's experience times anxiety and okay we're gonna do the same compute experience times play and instead of Z anxiety we have Z play uh, right here there we go and okay and then we save this data set and we go back to Amos and relink that data because it has changed. Oh, I wish it would just go back to where it's supposed to go. Data, trim, C, OK. And then we bring in those variables Z experience, anxiety, and see, play. There we go, those two. And then we can bring in experience. Oh, you know what I didn't do in those last ones? Uh, I didn't control for the things I was supposed to be controlling for. Sorry. Um, I was supposed to be controlling for uh, age and frequency, I think. Oops. So here's experience. Um, let's bring in frequency now because I'm just remembering it. Let's bring in age. Let's bring in uh, information acquisition as a dependent variable. Decision quality as a dependent variable. Playful as an independent variable. Anxiety, usefulness, and um, compuse. Are we going to be running bootstraps? I can't remember. No. So we can bring in social desirability here uh, and control for it. OK. Well, a mess we're going to have here. I'm going to select all of these guys here and these two, age and frequency, and covariate them. Draw covariances. It's going to be a terrible mess, but that's okay. I'm going to unselect all those. We're going to move these guys up where they're not bothering anybody. There we go. Um, and then we're going to start drawing those arrows again. Uh, so I didn't connect these to the to information acquisition and decision quality because I didn't need to. Of course, if I want to assess model fit, which I should, um, I'll need to check to see if that's okay. Plugins, name unobserved variables, save as causal path, and um, let's look at output. Standardized estimates, squared multiple correlations. I should have included those in my last hypothesis tests as well. Um, save, run. And we have standardized estimates. Good R squares. Um, let's go look at the output. Now, our theory was that. Experience dampens the negative relationship between anxiety and decision quality. Well, first we need to see if anxiety to decision quality is actually a negative effect. Anxiety to decision quality. Where are you? Here's anxiety to decision quality. Is, that, is actually not a negative effect. Well, that breaks things for us. If we look at the anxiety and experience... Um, oh, <laughs> Oops, I included the wrong arrows. So we need to include an arrow from anxiety to decision quality, or from the interactions. Excuse me. Let's see. From anxiety and experience to decision quality. What was the other one? Um, 
positive relationship between playfulness and information acquisition. So experience play on information acquisition. And I'll have to include experience on both of these. OK. And run it again. And look at uh, model fit real quick. Oops, here we go. Model fit is terrible. We need to figure out why. But in order to do that, we have to look at modification indices, which means we need to get rid of social desirability. Here's the big deal right here, E1 to E2. Uh, that needs to be covariated. So let's find out what that is. Back here, we have, uh, let, me, let me move this model. Move all of you down here. There we go. There we go. Unselect, all right, E1 and E2. Ah, I forgot to covary these guys as we did before. Let me go ahead and covary E1 and E2, just like we did before in the latent model, and E4 and E3. There we go, that should fix uh, quite a bit of issues there. Let's go look at the model fit now. Ah, that's better. Okay, so we're in good shape. Um, I wonder if we could even, I mean, we have social desirability bias retained. Oh, so that worked even without, even with the missing data. Excellent, or maybe we don't have missing data on that one. I could be mistaken. All right, so that's good. Um, we have good model fit. We can now assess the interaction effects. So. What was our theory? Our theory was that experience will dampen a negative relationship between anxiety and decision quality. Well, first we got to go see, is there a negative relationship? I think we looked at that and we decided there wasn't, but that was before we made these uh, changes. So we are looking from anxiety to decision quality. Anxiety to decision quality. This one right here, that one right there. And the answer is no, it's a positive effect. And if we look at the standardized regression weights, well, actually the p-value is not significant, so it's not positive. It's just no different from zero. Um, and so if we go look at the interaction, let's see what happens. And that was anxiety and experience to decision quality. Do we have that in here? You know what, we need to add that. So let's add that back in. This might have fallen out when I, um, had the blue screen of death here. So I'm gonna add that to that and that, and then um, experience to decision quality, I think it was play to information acquisition. Let me run this and make sure we still have good model fit. Sure enough, good model fit. Uh, CFI is good, RMCA actually is not so good. Either is the P close. Um, might wanna check out the, S, the R, uh, SRMR. But for now, yeah, that's not fabulous. If we look at the modification it sees E4 to frequency, which is probably usefulness and frequency. So let's control for the effect of frequency on usefulness. And we'll do it on comp use. There we go, run it again. I did it on comp use just to be consistent. Uh, modification it sees none showing. And CAFI is great. There we go, RMCA. Now we're all better. There we go. We only have four degrees of freedom, which is fabulous. If we wanted to increase our degrees of freedom, we could go find those paths in here that are not significant and maybe trim those out. But four is fine for now. Let's go to the uh, estimates one more time. Let's look at anxiety on information acquisition. No effect, not significant. If we look at ex um, anxiety and whoop, where, where'd you go? Oh, it was on decision quality, excuse me. Anxiety on decision quality, also not significant. Um, if we look at this interaction on decision quality, no effect, not significant. Um, so, bummer. Same with uh, this next one, which was our next hypothesis, I believe. Um, experience uh, strengthens the positive effect play has on information acquisition. Is that what we had? Let's see, experience strengthens, yeah, playfulness information acquisition. So in both cases, uh, the answer is no, uh, not supported. Uh, non-significant beta and p-value, well, the beta is the one that's not significant, uh, <clears throat> from IV and from interaction. So nothing there at all. Now let's pretend we did have a significant interaction. Um, <clears throat> what would we do? Well, we'd go and model it in the plotter here. Let me pull up the stats tools. We go to the two-way interaction plotter, <clears throat> zoom out a bit, 
and we'd stick in our variables. So in this case, our independent variable, let's say, is uh, playful, and let's say the moderator's experience, or was it frequency? Did I mess that up? No, I think it's experience. Um, and then the DV let, uh, was info acquisition. And the effect from our independent variable was something just minuscule. Um, so from, from anxiety to information acquisition, no, it was playful, excuse me, playful to information acquisition, uh, was not minuscule, it was a real effect, uh, 0 0.229, 0 0.229. From the moderator, that is experience, to information acquisition, just nothing, 0 0.0038, 0 0.0038, and then the interaction was uh, this one, 0 0.003, or 61, 0.0061, and you can see there is absolutely nothing going on. You, you can't see it, actually, probably, because the blue line is hiding behind the red line, which means there is zero difference. Um, experience does not strengthen that relationship one iota. If it did, like say this was a 0.3, then you'd see something going on, uh, differences, and I've interpreted it for you down here if you need it. Okay, so there's that. Um, we are on to our very last thing, multi-group effects. So we theorize that uh, gender would play a role such that for females, playfulness to usefulness is a stronger positive relationship. Let's go do that back in our latent model. I'm gonna save this just so we have it and let's go back to our latent model here. And let me zoom in. And we've removed interactions. Uh, we're just gonna look at two groups. Let's create those two groups. Here we have male new email close grab the data grouping variable oh, whoops cancel uh, grouping variable is gender and gender and grouping value is one and two okay and so we when we run this i uh, think 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 here we go run we just want to see if there are differences. Wait, it's taking its sweet time. Am I bootstrapping right now? Okay, it ran. Uh, let's see if those two paths that we theorized about, playfulness to usefulness and anxiety to usefulness. Let me zoom in here on those two paths. So here's the usefulness, um, and it's this line here and uh, this line here. Hit the up arrow, standardized. Okay, here's female. Um, you can't really see that. Let me move it. We go 0.29, and for May, uh, for this path, it's point, negative 0.05. That's, so we theorize that the positive relationship between playfulness and usefulness, here's playfulness and usefulness, yes, positive relationship, would be stronger for females. In this case, it's 0.29 for females. For males, it is 0.34. Well, we're wrong. Um, darn. <laughs> now let's look at anxiety to usefulness. Anxiety uh, to usefulness, stronger for females. It is a negative relationship. Uh, for males, it's 0.05, and for females, it's negative 0.05. <clears throat> so uh, we're wrong again. Now, we could actually test this um, by doing this. Uh, let's see. Analyze multiple group analysis. Yes, OK. And hit OK. Woo! Actually, you know what we can do? Just to simplify things a bit. Um, let's get rid of some of these. We don't need all of these. Um, we need the unconstrained. We don't need this one. Let me double click. Uh, measurement weights. I'm gonna delete this one. And um, let me go here and click on measurement intercepts. I don't need this one. Just simplifying here. Get rid of the covariances one. Get rid of the residuals one. And the measurement residuals. Get rid of that. Okay, so now we're just left with unconstrained and structural weights. That will simplify the output greatly. Okay, so what you want to do is go into, uh, actually just run it. It's going to run, it's going to do a chi-square difference test between this unconstrained model and this structural weights model constrained. And we'll go look at the model comparison. Here it is, and it says, yeah, the unconstrained model is very different from the fully constrained model. So, uh, 
males and females are different when it comes to this model. Now, we really just want to know about that one path, though. So globally, we're cool. Uh, let's look at locally at this single path. So this is a B5 underscore 1 and probably underscore 2. So let's go click on this structural weights. And we're going to go find B5. Here's B5. I'm going to move this control X and put it down at the bottom here. And then I'm going to grab everything else. Oof, that's a lot of stuff. And control X that. Don't delete it. Just control X it and hit close. So what we're saying is make the only thing, uh, make everything estimated freely, only constrain this one path to be equal. And we're going to run a chi-square difference test to see if it's constrained to be equal, is that different than estimating it freely? which is a test to see if we are different on those paths. So for this particular path, model comparison, the answer is no. This path is no different. p-value, not significant. Let's try the other path real quick. So let me go put back all that stuff um, right here, Control-V. I'll put back that B5, Control-X and Control-V up in here. And the other path we wanted to look at was, let's see, this one, B9. So. Let's grab B9, Control X, stick it down at the bottom, grab everything else, Control X, it's the only thing left, hit close, hit run, and go look at the output, go to comparisons, and the answer is nope, not different, even though those paths are different. Uh, you know, we, we looked at these values, and sure enough, those look very different, right? Male 32, female uh, 36. Well, not that different, I guess. <laughs> oh, right now we're constraining them to be equal. That's the problem. Um, go to the unconstrained model. There we go, 29 versus 34. Well, st statistically speaking, those are no different. So what would we say here? We'd say, um, let's see, this second one we discovered was absolutely no difference, right? Uh, we ran a chi-square difference test, ran a chi-square difference test um, with the unconstrained versus uh, constrained only individual path um, models and found no significant difference. So not supported not supported. Uh, this is the case for both. Uh, we'd report the betas as well, right? Beta equals uh, x for male and x for x, uh, y for female, um, or whatever they were. It was 0 0.29, 0 0.34, or something like that. 0 0.29, 0 0.34, or maybe it was the other way around, males and females. Anyway, we'd report that, report that they were not different. We did a chi-square difference test. Um, so not supported. What was that it? Sweet. And then the rest of it is just formatting and, and filling in the narrative. And that is the entire analysis. Boom, in two hours.